Hello and welcome to The Kerner Show with me, your host, Gavin Harris. And today I am joined by Liz Melvin of Elizabeth Melvin Photography. Hello, Liz. And how are you? I'm very well, thank you. Excited to be here. This is a novelty. Amazing. Yes, it is a novelty. It's a novelty for me as well. Obviously very new to it, but um, um, fantastic. I'm so glad that you've, uh, you've, uh, you've joined me. Um, the first question I would like to ask, COVID. How has it affected you? We're reaching the 12-month anniversary. Yes. It's been interesting, I think, it's probably the better way, best way of putting it. I just decided to go full-time photographer. I've been a photographer for years. Anyone who knows will know I've been a professional photographer for years, but done it part-time. And January 2018, I thought, that's it. Now is the time. Let's do it full-time, go full belt, move back to Cornwall, because I'm originally from Cornwall, Falmouth, but decided that's it. Just got building up nicely. Mm. And I thought, oh, it's going well. People start to like me, doing the networking, thoroughly enjoying it, and then wallop. <laughs> Bang. Yes. Bang, wallop, crash. Yeah. Yes. So then it was the equivalent of deary me. And a bit, like, a bit like everyone else, actually. It's a bit of a shock first. And for the first month, I reckon I didn't do much but think, oh, uh, it'll wear off or it'll all be all right. And then thought, nope, got to take some proactive do something proactive and take action. So that meant, for me, looking where other opportunities were. So I couldn't do people in the same way because I'm a passionate people photographer. Love people. And people but, love you, just to be clear. Uh, oh, that's very, very kind. <laughs> At least to my face. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, right, okay, what, what, other, what other specialisms do I have? And that is property and products both of which can be done without people. So I've done property where someone just says, here's the keys, I need this done, I need it to say this, just tell me when you're back out again. So I've done a few Airbnb-type properties, and that was nice. Then the products um, can be shipped to me. So I was booked by uh, a shark charity, actually, and they said, <laughs> Lizzie, can we just send you some products? I'll be one, one minor box will arrive. Fine, I looked forward to it. I've never seen so much packed into one box. It was, I opened it up and it was like one of these concertina jack in the boxes. The whole lot went doing and more soft toys came out than I have had the pleasure of seeing for some time. So I photographed all these things. There were 120 items wow. in a box that wasn't much. Those who know me, I'm only five foot tall. So it was no, to, certainly no taller than me. And the problem was not photographing it. That was fine. It was getting it back in the box to send it back again. Entertaining. I bet. But then I've done bottles and then was proactively looking for uh, work, as you do. So I thought, what do I really like doing? What's a nice challenge? And I came across this uh, rum in a Truro market. I thought, that's a lovely bottle. Really nice people running the stall. I thought that would be a challenge. I wouldn't mind being their photographer. They've clearly got one. But I thought, that's not going to stop me. I'm going to give it a go. Took their bottle, looked up their story. Because it's all for me, it's all about the photography story. It's mm -hmm. what they're trying to say, who they're trying to sell to. And they call it Seafarers, the Seafarers Gin. So I thought, that sounds like a good thing. They said it was born of rocks and sea and wild Cornwall. Wow. So I thought, fine. It sounds tasty, just you describing oh, it. I tell you, it's fabulous. I don't drink gin. Uh, most of alcohol disagrees with me, so I'm <laughs> bet you're safe. If anyone's sending me alcohol and you just want it photographed, it will return. <laughs> Can't say the same for whiskey. Husband likes whiskey. <laughs> but these Jerry, things, I've not met Jerry yet, but okay, noted. <laughs> noted. Christmas is noted. Noted. So I took, they took the bottles down into the countryside. I had a harvest, harvest gin and, a, and another one and took them down and just set up scenes. Then I sent them the sent the sent to um, Rose Mullion. It was sent them the photographs. Said I know you've got a photographer, but if you ever have a gap and you need another, I would love to be considered. And left it at that. And then oh, months later they came back and said we have an in-house photographer. She's very good. She's doing this, this, and this. We need some extras. Would you be prepared to do the extras? Yes, yes, I would. Lovely. That's incredible. <laughs> That's a lovely, lovely piece of uh, marketing advice there as well. Yeah, put yourself out there. A hundred percent, yeah. And you, you've kind of gone the extra mile as well. You've, you know, you've taken a product that you, you can see the beauty of. Mm. You've put it into its own place. That's incredible. That's, uh, that's commendable, really, really. And when, when did that happen then, sorry? Um, I would think 18 months ago. It was certainly 
around the time, must have been just after the first lockdown eased, I think, because there were market stores, and I know we bought the, the gin to market in Truro. Okay, so back when things to, were normal. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Yeah. I think the funny thing, though, is, is that they wanted something taken in the sea, so I took the bottle down to the seaside, and those who know me will know I'm a curvy lady. I am not just skinny twig. So I decided that the best way of getting a good photograph with waves braving, breaking over the bottle to get the proper message out was to put it in the sea, in the waves. Oh, boy. But that's not going to work if you're looking down on it. <laughs> so <laughs> I lay down in the wet sand with the waves to get this bottle photo. And when, I was to- when I'm photographing, I'm totally oblivious. I'm absolutely mm. concentrating on the picture. You're in the zone. I'm in the zone. And it's only when I stop and I look round. <laughs> I'm being watched. <laughs> Do people have their mobile phones out videoing and, f- and photographing you? And they're going, it would be better if you drank it, dear. <laughs> what are you doing? That's incredible. Oh, That's it was incredible. more fun watching me get up, I swear. <laughs> <laughs> well, if you had the waves breaking over no you dignity, as well. No dignity whatsoever. Oh, wow. That's incredible. That's incredible. <laughs> so, so let me ask then, you, you, you mentioned again, this is something I genuinely don't know. How long have you been photographing for professionally? About 14 years. Wow. Okay. 14 years or so. Yes, it must be about that now. But I, but I do know, um, obviously, from, from uh, following you on social media, and uh, anyone that's not following Lizzie really should, um, you, you uh, take a lot of inspiration from your dad. I do, and my mum. My, well. Yeah, because my mum was the photographer. Mm-hmm. My dad was an artist and writer. Some incredible work. You've shared some of his paintings and just... Yes, they're, they're very, very good. So when you're, I think when you're surrounded by it, you absorb it without realising. So my mum used to do do-it-yourself photographs. My dad did the do-it-yourself, how to lay paths, how to put your electrics in when you're allowed to, mm-hmm. and lawns and hedges and everything else. And then mother would pho- photograph it. And we travelled all across Europe doing that. Because my father had a saying, all his stuff was translated and went all the way around Europe. But you couldn't always get your money. Oh, really? No, it wasn't always that easy. But if you were in front of them, (laughs) they sounded to refuse. So he used to travel Europe. My dad used to travel. He spoke 14 languages at one point. Wow. And he'd go and demand his payment in person, which was entertaining. So you learned a lot travelling like that. Amazing. And do you, do you think, was your dad Cornish? Was your mum Cornish? No, they, they were Yorkshire. Yorkshire. Yorkshire right. and Derbyshire. Amazing. But they moved down to Cornwall. Gosh. Well, I know I was down here. By the time I was 16, we were already down here. So that's a lot of, lot of years. Uh, yeah. So and they, never, they never moved out. They lived in Mabe. Mabe. Falmouth first, then, then Mabe. So amazing. So I'm imagining um, from a kind of business perspective, I imagine you learn a lot from your dad and um, kind of things to do, things not to do, um, life lessons learned and passed down, <laughs> so to speak. Yes, yes. I've, I did. Not, not all were repeatable. <laughs> <laughs> was he, was he um, quite a large man? No, don't be, how dare you, sir? <laughs> no, no, no. I mean, was he a stocky, not like me, not rotund like me? No, he was, sti- he was stick thin. But what I did get from him was that if you want something, work for it. Put it, put it out there, s- aim for what you want, really push. And if it means saying yes before you're ready, mm-hmm. say yes. So, for instance, he was writing these articles. Mum was doing the photography. And he did a film for Germany, a TV film. He was, he was filming for them, being filmed, I should say, for them. And he watched the cameras they were using. He watched what they were doing. My mum was paying very close attention to what they were up to. And the magazine article, the magazine people said, we're thinking about moving into TV films. Could you make these TV films for us? Wow. And he went, of course, yes. Well, at that time, there was not so much as a camera there was no Shane Solomon <laughs> from the Cornwall Channel, no? No. So the minute he got the contract signed, he went out, bought a Bolex, bought all the equipment, wow. and got practising. And they must have made... I don't know how many films they made, but they certainly did a lot. Wow. They did a lot. And the kids, as in us lot, we did feature in quite a few of them at the time. Amazing. For Germany. For Germany. For Germany, not for, not for the UK market, but for Germany. And the weird... So you, were, you, were, you would have been quite famous in Germany at some stage. <laughs> yes, about... At some point, yes, at some <laughs> point. I think what was really, I mean, they always do things a bit differently, my parents. Mm. So there came a point where the government was about to change. 
in the UK. And one of the things they said was, we're going to be taxing money from abroad really, really heavily. And my dad goes, that's where, to the family, he goes, that's where most of our income comes from. We are going to have to do something. We're going to have to either be able to up sticks and leave and live in Europe quick or be able to manoeuvre off. And it's either van and caravan, which we already had, or we buy a boat. I remember you telling me this story. <laughs> so, I love this story. Please continue. And it was this, and so um, a boat was decided on. So then it was, okay, it's got to be big enough to live on. It's got to be able to move. And where do you find one? And we actually found a motor torpedo boat that was being done up on Roll Quay in Barnstable, which they bought. And I went to the sixth form college at Barnstable, which is why I went there, because we were on Roll Quay at that time. And then my father goes, right, government didn't come in as we expected. We're not all going to be taxed to oblivion. We are going to have to make this boat work. We need to earn money Mm. from this boat. That's a proper business mindset that your your dad had. Oh, yes. Incredible. Everything has to work and earn, including the kids. So so what he said, right, that's it. Um, We will do a book on sailing uh, from Land's End to Dover. Because what he noticed, chatting to people in in Barnsville area and others, was that the local sailors, the, the amateur sailors, got lost on regular intervals. They couldn't find their way around to get home properly. They were, they were, we were linked to the lifeboat service. We used to uh, be on call if we were out. The lifeboat service could say, see watch, are you out there, more or less. Wow, you guys are multifaceted <laughs> family, like the <laughs> family of superheroes or something. Yeah. Well, the parents are. The rest, the rest of us are just trying to keep up. <laughs> so yeah, but he did that. He did the, and because he's an artist, what he realised was that people didn't know where they were on charts. They would see things, but didn't know where they were. So we sailed. It's pretty difficult out at sea. There are not very many landmarks. No. Uh, well, there's more than you think. Really? But what, but what there okay. are, what he did was uh, took Sea Watch. So I was on the wheel, brother's in the kitchen, someone else is on radar. I think my sister was on radar. Mum was certainly on the pictures. And um, what you had to do was keep the boat a mile offshore, which doesn't sound difficult, mm. but some parts of Cornwall are extremely interesting a mile <laughs> offshore. Never to mind, never mind around the Isle of Wight and some other interesting areas but you had to keep a mile off and then all the photographs were taken by my, by mum and dad together and they were on polaroids if people remember the polaroids mm-hmm. then what they the, were done the, the shaky ones yeah they're exactly yeah. the shaky ones but imagine that in hundreds thousands of pictures they were then glued together and then he drew out from the from the from the photographs a panoramic picture of what he was what was there just picking out the key things That's incredible. and he would say if you can see this church that white house and you can hear this signal f- and from because there's radio signals out and there's lighthouses. If you can see these things, hear that you are here wow. <laughs> on your chart. That's incredible. Was, well, he got he was very pleased. He got made honorary master of the vessel for it, wow. and he got he got was allowed to call himself captain. Only we drew the line. We are not calling you captain. I'm sorry. <laughs> the rest of the world might think your stripes are lovely, but we are not calling you captain. That's- that's an that's an incredible story. I did not know that. I know you yeah. mentioned that you guys lived on a lived on a boat, which mm. which blew my mind anyway. But that's just an incredible story. Yeah, she was uh, people who are of long standing in Falmouth will remember Sea Watch because we were anchored off the wow. main pier. And and if people wanted to learn more about this, I'm guessing there's stuff online. Um, there will be some things online. She used to call for anyone wanted to go back in history. Mm. She was a German vessel used in the last war in the Channel Islands, um, and she was called Seewach. So exactly the same translation as Sea Watch, but yeah. the German version. And I know mm. she features in some of the history books that are in the Channel Islands because I found one when I visited. Wow. She's definitely there. That's incredible. Sadly, no more. No more? No. Um, so for those, again, in Falmouth, there was a Storm 10 inside Falmouth Harbour. Very, very rare occurrence. Wow. Very rare. When, when was this, sorry? Has to be eight. I'm saying, I'm thinking 80s. Wow. No, okay. Somebody else will know exactly when because it's so rare an occurrence. Mm. And Sea Watch had uh, Danforth anchor down, anchors down, which are whopping great things, mm. into into the seabed. But for security, because we were big, and if we swung, we might take something with us. We were also um, chained down to a two-ton concrete block embedded in the base of Falmouth Harbour. Wow! So you'd think nothing could do. No, you'd think that would be you'd quite sturdy. Nothing. Yeah. Yes, but we got lifted. The whole lot lifted in the storm. Nothing broke. The concrete came out of the mud. The chains all held but lifted, 
and Sea Watch was uh, flung up onto Flushing, oh onto the only rock on Flushing, and so was lost. Oh no! So uh, that was it. That was interesting. Trying to rescue everything, but was, there's, but the ships lived. You on. guys weren't in there, just to confirm. No, we weren't. We were all on land. Oh. It was uh, we all worked. Uh, on land and we were all off the boat that's very lucky though. which was which was good and mm. we and there were others living in Falmouth harbour and most of them I think all were saved it was just the boats that weren't but ours lives on in Simon Le Bon's boat wow. because I should say ship probably ship because uh, ours was made of teak mm-hmm. and had wonderful teak uh, wood so it was re Repurposed. 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 Yeah. So it's still sailing in a different version, which is nice. That's incredible. It's that's nice. a, that's such a lovely story. Um, Lizzie, Liz, Liz, Liz Melvin, the photographer, though. Um, mm-hmm. How can people get in touch with you? How can you help businesses in Cornwall and obviously uh, venturing across the Tamar Bridge? Mm. Okay. So the the way I like to help is to. Think about what you and your business needs first. And what I don't do is if I meet you and you're you're going to book me and you want me to photograph for you, the first thing that doesn't come out is the camera. Because unless I chat to you first, I can't see your mannerisms. I can't see how you look naturally. And you can't talk naturally about your business if you're conscious out of the side of your eye that there's a camera lurking. Like there is... Today, yeah. Like there is today, yes. <laughs> I keep on glimpsing yeah, over. And yeah, I'm, I'm making it. No, I know what my profile looks like. <laughs> Be kind. <laughs> but uh, it's um, yeah, it's all about it's all about the story. So once I've heard from the person about the story and their business, it then moves on to what they don't like when they're being photographed. Almost everyone looks at a picture of themselves and goes, "Oh look, didn't have to pick out that. Look at my nose, my ears, hair." I'm too fat, too thin, too wrinkly, whatever it is, because we've all got something. And it's never what I see, because I'm thinking, good face, good eyes, well, light like that, be brilliant like that. But if the person doesn't like a particular feature, all they'll ever see is that feature if you don't change things. So I then light and pose according to what someone is telling me. They then get to see what I'm taking, because I always say the first picture off the camera is not going to be right. Mm. Because part, partly because I've watched people tense up a little because they, they will the minute the camera comes out they stop being natural and mm-hmm. go ding lovely yeah. can't wait get my best side get yes, my best I. side yeah so but then I, then I say be ruthless and I mean ruthless there's no point being polite about this what don't you like what are you seeing that first jumps out at you at this picture and because people start to then trust that you're really genuinely wanting to do the best for them and I am I want them to look good. They'll then say, I don't like this, or I see that. Once I know that, I can change things. Once I've got the person right and they're happy, they start to relax, and I can see it in sort of shoulders and tenseness and everything else. And if people really need guidance in posing, I will help pose. And I'll do things to help them look, look better, look more upright, and depending on what, what sort of look they're going for. But then there's the business. Who are they, what are they trying to sell? Yeah. And who are they trying to reach? Because that's really, really key. So I would have had a chat beforehand about who they're trying to reach because it matters hugely as to what you might wear and how you might feel. So someone who's trying to get to, I don't know, an expensive clothing brand needs to wear something that reflects that expense in some way. And I'm a firm advocate of charity shops. Those who know my history will know why because I used to work for Cancer Research UK. Brilliant organisation. Amazing. Amazing stuff lands in these shops. You don't have to pay a fortune to look the part, whatever yeah. part you're trying to play. And I know there are people who say you shouldn't judge by looks. And whilst I'd advocate that, I'd also say most people do. Yeah. And it's you, almost a, an unconscious thing, isn't it? It is. It's you're reacting without knowing why. People aren't doing it consciously. They're yeah. not deliberately trying to do that. It's just they have a reaction to it. So if I know where you're going, then I will try to encourage you to look, but not be uncomfortable. Because if you're uncomfortable in what you're wearing, it'll never work. So it's it's a mix. Love that. It's a mix. And then it's put it together mm-hmm. and create for that person specifically. So even if they want what you might call stock photography, the stock photography will be their hands on something, their booklets, yeah, their messages. So people might go, oh, it's a bit like brand photography, but it's clearly about the person. Love it. And I want I want people to react. And I it's I want people to not say, 
gosh, that's a good photograph. I want them to say, oh, isn't that you? Amazing. Because if You're that's... You're trying to get the person underneath. The, for me, it's personality on the paper. Yes. And I think people buy personalities. They buy people. So that if you've got a chance to get a little bit of personality on the page, you've got a chance of attracting the right sort of customer for you. I love that. And, and, uh, and testament to that. Lizzie, because obviously we met through your partnerships. Mm. Um, and that's one of the first things that I noticed about you. You're very, very um, honest um, and a very, very transparent person. And, uh, well, you attracted me as a customer, first first of all. And, and I know you've done a lot of work with a lot of other people as well. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to end it here. But thank you very much for coming to see me today. My um, huge pleasure. <laughs> I'm going to put all your details, um, obviously, on this podcast as well. But I would highly recommend anyone that needs photography, and whether that's people, whether that's property, or whether that's products, get in touch with Lizzie. But thank you very much, Lizzie. That's brilliant. Thank you very much for inviting me. No problem.